Thank you so much uh, for the introduction and for the invitation. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here and, and to be able to talk to you about the work that we do. So my, my talk today will be trying to resolve uh, this question. And uh, I would like to start with this slide, I mean, of a classical movie, The Planet of the Apes. Not the, the newer versions, but I, I still like the, the old one. And uh, one, of the, one of the critical moments in that film, it has several critical moments, but one of them is when the human speaks. And then the, the non-human apes realizes, whoa, this is special. So I would like to focus on that. And I would like to focus on language not because of the, um, the type of communication that, that we can, that we can uh, use it for, but for the implications that, that this system of communication may have on the way we think on the way we solve problems. And of course, I mean, one, one question that sometimes one could ask is, we compare the, the, the ape mind and the human mind, and we see there are some similarities, some differences. And one question is, OK, uh, what would we need to do to this ape to turn it into more like a human mind? And this is a question about the ape language, the type of uh, artificial communication systems that have been used to study their cognition. And there's been some ideas about whether these artificial uh, communication systems can upgrade uh, the mind of the apes. So this is the question I will try to resolve today. And uh, let me start by saying that the, the, these artificial communicative systems have an impact. I, I can already tell you that. I've been give, giving you away the answer. Yes, there is an impact. But the question, and this will be the main, uh, the main thing I would like to focus on, what is the nature? of that impact. I'll tell you, there is, there is a change, but where is that change? And is it deep? Is it shallow? This is what I will try to, to go over during this talk. The plan that I would like to, 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 to do today is first I would like to talk to you a little bit about ape communication, just a little bit. Uh, then also about uh, ape language, again, just a little bit. And then we will tackle the main question of the, of, of the talk today, which is, can we upgrade the ape mind by using an artificial system of communication. Uh, then we will, we will talk about what is the nature of this impact. And finally, I will end with some, of, uh, some considerations about ape minds and human minds. As you will see, I think it's great that Peter gave the talk uh, before me, because you will see that some of the issues that I will talk about resonate really well with, with the things that you saw this morning in his presentation. So let's start with ape communication. What, what is the ape, of, uh, what ape communication that we study? Basically, there are three main forms uh, on, in ape communication. One is uh, vocalizations, facial expressions, and gestures. We saw other, other forms, like this morning we also saw drumming, which is uh, an additional form. But vocalizations, facial expressions, and gestures are the main channels by which they communicate with each other. And each of them have different features. So let me go over these features. In terms of vocalizations, they've been described between 10 to 20 different types. And these vocalizations, originally, ethologists thought that they convey simply um, emotion. But now we know they convey emotion plus other aspects that have to do with uh, referentiality. Listeners to this call are expecting to see certain things when they hear other individuals uh, vocalize. Now, one interesting thing about vocalizations is that they are very inflexible. Their production is very inflexible. I mean, chimpanzees or, or, or gorillas or basically uh, hardly any mammals can produce new vocalizations. Marine mammals may be different in that regard, but they cannot produce new vocalizations. They, they have a fixed repertoire. They have some flexibility in the, in, the, in the sense of they can decide when they vocalize. They can control their vocalizations. They can inhibit, but they cannot change the topography of those vocalizations. Now, for facial expressions, there are between six and 10 types. And they cover a, a range of um, emotions that we observe in chimpanzees having to do with it. Here, the picture that you see here is this chimpanzee. Is a, this is a play face. This chimpanzee is engaging play with another chimpanzee. And this is the, the facial expression that you observe. Now, some, some of my colleagues have started to think that maybe Having the vocalization as discrete units is not perhaps the best analysis, but it's more a continuum gradient between these vocalizations. But uh, for our purposes today, I will tell you between 6 and 10 captures, I think, most of the facial expressions. But I also want to warn you that some of my colleagues 
don't like that anymore. They prefer to see it more as a continuum. These are basically uh, expressions that have to do with emotion, the, the communication of emotion. And just like vocalizations, they are pretty inflexible. One question I always ask my colleagues that study facial expressions is, can a chimpanzee or another ape or a primate fake a vocalization, uh, sorry, a facial expression? Can they fake, can, can they put a, a facial expression of, I am really afraid of you, when in reality they are not. They are faking it. And we don't know. And this would be very interesting to know because it would mean that they have a voluntary control over that. We can fake facial expressions. Uh, some are, in our species, some are better than others, but we have some control over that. As far as we know, the non-human apes, we don't have any evidence suggesting that they have this control. And finally, gestures. And gestures is the, the aspect that uh, I personally, and with Mike Tomasello and, and our colleagues, we have investigated more intensively. So uh, gestures uh, include a repertoire of about 20 to 60 gestures. And uh, two features that are important in gestures is one is they are context dependent, and I will, I will tell you what I mean by this. And second, they are very flexible. This is very interesting because in comparison with vocalizations and facial expressions, gestures are uh, very flexible. They can uh, produce gestures, uh, they can invent new gestures, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you, you will see this. I will show you some examples. And so this is very different with when, we, when, when we compare it with vocalizations or, or facial expression. The types of gestures between 20 and 60, again, it depends what the authors you talk to. Some authors are happy to say they have 20, 30 uh, uh, gestures. And others say, no, they have more than that. So in, in our field, like in other fields, there are always the tension between the lumpers and the splitters. Some people prefer to consolidate. Some people prefer to, to make it uh, more diverse. Um, now, the gestures that I will be talking about are gestures like the, the one that you see here. So this is called arm reach. And this, this, in this particular case, this uh, chimpanzee is begging for food. Okay? Uh, but other gestures involve the whole body body postures, and also sometimes uh, head movements. Okay? So not just hand movements, but also head and also body <coughs> postures. So just to give you a feel of what are these gestures, I mean, what is, uh, I'll give you now some examples. So as I told you, this is one. So here you have other examples, and they use them for a number of things. For instance, here you're going to see some gestures used now in a conflict situation. Now these two chimpanzees, they are fishing for something in the moat. Can we dim the lights somehow so you can see it better? Is it possible? So these two chimpanzees, so you know, one of these chimpanzees has a stick, and he's fishing on this moat, and this, chimp this chimpanzee is trying to steal it. So you see, this chimpanzee, be, um, sorry, this stick belongs to this chimpanzee. And this chimpanzee tries to steal it. It's pulling from there, and now you will see the facial expression of this chimpanzee. You will see that there, that facial expression. So that's a fear grin. And now that, putting the hand like this, offering the wrist, is a gesture that they use for appeasement purposes. So that's one uh, gesture. So there was a, you know, there was a, a potential conflict. You know, this chimpanzee was trying. This chimpanzee was trying to steal the stick of this one. Didn't like that, and now, and now it's over. So she can keep her stick and continue fishing, and the conflict has been averted. Thank you very much. So also another gesture is this is called arm pull, and you will see this infant wants to go to a different place in the enclosure. It's going to go to mom, and this is what the infant does, and then mom complies, and they go to another. A place in the enclosure. And finally here, you're going to see a reaching gesture like this one. But this one, you see this male is reaching for this female, but he's not asking for any food. What he's doing is trying to recruit her as an ally because this male has been involved in a conflict. So it's trying, it's a recruitment gesture. Now, I told you before that this gesture is also used for begging for food. So this is very interesting because it leads us to one of the things that is important to know about the gestures, how chimpanzees use gestures. Now, I have this cartoon by Gary Larson, and I have it here because I think it's a good demonstration of what chimpanzee gestures are not about. Okay? 
So here you have, in this cartoon, you have, this is a lab in the States where, you know, it goes and says, Matthews, we are getting another one of those strange habla espanol sounds. See, I'm from Spain, so I know what that means, but they obviously don't. And here you can see it's saying, que pasa, that means what's going on, habla espanol, bien fallo, that means correct, incorrect, anyway, so. Now, this discreteness that we find in language is nothing like what we find in the chimpanzees. In the chimpanzees, the context is crucial. Because this reaching gesture can work to retrieve an infant, can work to recruit an ally, or can work to request a food transfer. And in all these cases, it's the same gesture. So the context informs you about what is this gesture about. What is the recipient want from you? In addition, Gestures are very flexible because they have more than one way to ask for food. So this is one way that you can ask for food, but if that does not work for whatever reason, you can have other, other forms like doing like this or, in some, or others like rubbing chin. Some of these gestures are very idiosyncratic. Some individuals only use them. This is basically universal. All chimpanzees use the reaching gesture, but some of these like rub chin are very special about particular pairs. So we see that there is some, some variability and some flexibility in the way they use gestures. And something very important, the context is crucial very often to make sense of what the, um, the individual using the gesture is going at, is, 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 uh, does want to get. Now, I have here some, some examples of gestures. Again, just to give you uh, some, some, uh, some illustration of the different gestures. And here in quotes, a translation is what, what is the context in which gestures appear. So, so here, the hand begging, give me, the reach, come, follow me. And here you have other examples, follow me, give me, chase me, OK, come, mate with me, turn around, follow me, groom me here. Now, one thing that strikes you of this list is that chimps are very demanding. <laughs> they ask things for their conspecifics. And this is going to be very important, because the imperative format is crucial. Their, most of their communication is about imperative, in the imperative format. We, we will come back to the imperative uh, motivation later. Now, I also told you that they are, they are flexible. And they are flexible in, at least in two ways. First is they know when they need to use the gesture to be effective. They use gestures that have different modalities, visual modality, auditory modality, and tactile modality. Let me show you an example of, a, of the visual modality. Okay? So this is going to be a male. This is the male courting a, a chimpanzee female. This female is a nester, is ready for mating, or so he thinks. Okay? And then the, the male is going to use a gesture to entice her to mate. And this is the gesture. There you go. Now, this, this video, I call, it, I call this video the evolution of dirty dancing. <laughs> so now, the reason I'm showing you that gesture is because, look, this is a visual gesture. It makes no noise. It does not involve touch. And what the male does, at this point, he is behind her. So what he's going to do is, look, he's going to cut across. And he's going to position himself in front where she can see him. And then he's going to use the gesture. Okay. So this is a case where he needs to use a visual gesture. And then he positions himself in a place where she can see her. This is going to link with theory of mind, mind reading. Um, aspect. So it seems that the male is sensitive to where he needs to be so that the female can get the message. Now I'm going to show you the opposite. And in this case, we have the alpha female, the dominant female that is carrying a baby, and we have this other female here doing nothing. Now this female is going to play a joke on them. And what he's going to do is going to slap her. It's, this female is not dominant. And believe it or not, he's going to slap the dominant female. Now, wait a minute. How can this happen? Well, this female is not completely stupid, because he's not going to slap her in the face. What she's going to do is she's going to do that. You see, the female just moves, and now that the back is turned, and the female cannot see, boom, <laughs> it's going to hit her. So it seems that the chimpanzees have a sensitivity for when it's appropriate to use gestures, when it's appropriate to deploy certain behaviors. Now, this sensitivity, this, you can see some of that in vocalizations also. Because there is in vocalizations, there's also audience effects. Depending who's around, they vocalize in one way 
or another, or they vocalize or they do not vocalize. So this is not special about gestures. Now, what is special about gestures is, OK, sorry, here you have some data. Those are just two anecdotes. Just here to show you that this is not just about chimpanzees. What you have here is the percent of gestures that the recipient is attending, is oriented and looking at the one producing the gestures. You see, when they want to use visual gestures, they mostly do it when the other one is oriented and looking. When they use tactile gestures, then you don't need it. Then they use it much less. And all species show this sensitivity. Now, one thing that is different compared to, gesture, to, to vocalizations is this. Is they can produce new gestures that we do not find in their natural repertoire. And once a gesture, one that they borrow from humans, is pointing. Chimpanzees can learn to point for humans because it works really well for us. We respond right away. Now, there is some discussion where these gestures come from. And there is originally, people thought, well, the chimpanzees are imitating. But now we know that imitation, chimpanzees are not so good at imitating the gestures of others. So the other, other proposals have been ontogenetic ritualization. Maybe the chimpanzees are shaping each other in the way they, they use gestures, or, chi or humans are shaping chimpanzees at using these gestures. At least you could, you could argue that one way that this pointing gesture could have appear in these chimpanzees because originally was trying to reach for food. The human sees it, gives the food, and now after a few times, the chimpanzee stops reaching for it. It just uses a, you know, an ineffective reaching, but because the human understands it as a communicative, with communicative intent, then they, they respond. And therefore, the chimpanzee starts to use a pointing gesture. Uh, there is now some, some people arguing that I mean, many of the gestures appear by maturation and, and selection. So all gestures in the chimpanzee repertoire are there. And what the chimpanzees do in their repertoires, they simply they trim them. Okay? So there is no need to learn anything new. Everything is already in place. The problem I have with that explanation is that I could not explain things like this. That you know, the chimpanzees and other apes have the possibility of learning new gestures, something that has not been documented with vocalizations. Now, very quickly. If we had to give you, if I had to give you a sentence of how apes use gestures, this is what I would say, and it's very similar to what Peter says. Uh, Peter said this morning is that you know how they use gestures flexibly to request for the here and now, and mostly in a dyadic format, and lacking true iconicity. That's a definition that I would use to define the gestures. Now, you all know that chimpanzees and other apes have been trained to use different types of artificial uh, communication systems. One is American Sign Language. And the other one is tokens and lexigrams. American Sign Language have been studied mostly by, by the Gardners and by, uh, by, the Fouts, uh, by the Foutses, while the tokens and lexigrams have mostly been investigated by Primac and the Rambaus. Now, very quickly, and uh, again, I will, I will fly through these. Uh, very quickly, in terms of American Sign Language, the repertoire, when you look across different studies, is about 200 uh, signs. Some studies have more signs, but it also depends how you count it. Some studies have, um, have reported up to 500, but it depends how, how you count them. Uh, they include things like we would call nouns, verbs, adverbs, pronouns, adjectives. So this is not something like it's just about nouns. They also have uh, signs for actions, uh, pronouns, etc. Many of these signs are iconic, but uh, others are arbitrary. There is no resemblance with, uh, with the referent. And one thing that they achieve, and this is very important because it's something that you do not see in their natural communication, is displaced reference. With these signs, they can refer to something that is not there, and they can even refer to things that, uh, that they, it's displaced in, in, and it's not there spatially, and it's not there temporally. They can refer to things that happened yesterday. However, most of the signs that they use are, once again, on an imperative format. Now, what about tokens and lexigrams? The repertoire, again, depending on the studies, 20 to 200. Um, again, if you look at what type of lexigrams, they fall into the same categories. Uh, now, all the lexigrams, again, um, again um, unlike the signs, are uh, arbitrary. They have no resembles with, their, with what they refer to. And again, with these uh, tokens and lexigrams, they can, they can, they can achieve displays reference, and they, but however, they are also in an imperative format. So the natural communication of the apes, as I said before, it's in terms of reference, is restricted to the here and now. 
But when they are trained on artificial communication, this temporal and spatial limitation is overcome. And then they can refer beyond the here and now. They can refer to things that are not spatially present there and things that temporally occur yesterday, for instance. This is going to be interesting. This is already, I think, a big change. Because one may have thought, well, maybe this place reference is only something that humans have evolved. But here we see that as soon as we give them a means of communicating, no problem. They will, uh, they will, they will use it. And they will use it to refer to things that are not there. Um, I'm going to park this, I think, important aspect, this important lesson of the artificial systems of communication. And now I'm going to move to the main topic of the talk. Now we've given a very brief introduction to, to the way they use gestures, to the, 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 the way they, uh, they use uh, ape language. And now we're going to go to the main question. And the main question is, given that they can learn these artificial systems of communication, are their thought processes different? from the thought processes of other apes that do not have this, um, this training. The first person that I'm aware that asked this question was David Primack. And David Primack looked at analogical reasoning and compared the performance of uh, apes trained on the artificial system of tokens. And he compared the ability of solve analogies between chimpanzees trained in this communication system and chimpanzees that were not trained. This will be the main topic that I will cover, but I will cover two other topics. Another topic is that one that is, is called a reverse reward contingency. And this is, I will explain in detail, but this has not to do with training about uh, language training, but numerical training. If you don't know about this, don't worry about it, because when I, when I will present this part, uh, I, I will explain exactly what I mean. And the third one is about understanding intentions. So now we are not going to be focused on a particular symbolic system of representation. We're going to talk about something more general. It's what impact does have being raised in a human home have on the cognition of the great apes? All these three aspects have in common that different authors have argued that there is a profound impact. There is a major change that is mediated by these uh, reading uh, methods in the case of enculturation or the uh, symbolic systems. Now, let's analyze the data for this. Analogical reasoning first. And as I said, this is the, the main proponent of this was David Prima. And he used the main method that he used was one that is called relational matching to sample. How does relational matching to sample works? It's very simple. The subject is presented with the stimuli. In this case, it is a pair of stimuli. And then it looks at that. This is the sample. And then it's offered two alternatives. And it's got to pick the one that matches the sample. Now, here you could do one of two things. You could say, well, uh, I could match by the shape. So this pair is more similar to this pair than to this pair, because there is a common element here. But another thing that you could do is you could focus on the relation between the objects and then match based on the relation. That's why it's called relational matching to sample. In this case, this is a relation. These two objects are different. And these two are the same. And these two are different. Therefore, under relational matching to sample, you should pick this. That's, in a nutshell, relational matching to sample. When chimpanzees train, language trained chimpanzees are compared to language naive chimpanzees. This is the work of David Primack. It was found that only language trained chimpanzees can solve this kind of problem. If you read Premax writings, at least in my reading, but you should do it yourself to see what impression you get. I get the impression that the earlier writings, he was more strong in this position. He was saying that language training had a deep impact on this ability. And without that training, you will not be able to solve relational matching to sample. In later writings, that position is toned down. And he's not talking anymore about a massive and uh, deep impact on the cognition, but he's talking about an enhancement of capabilities that may, be already, may, may already be there, maybe in a kind of a dormant state. 
Now, these results by Primac were challenged by other, by other uh, researchers. And the first challenge came from uh, Thompson and colleagues. And they, what they found is that they, were cap where they documented relational matching to sample in chimpanzees that had not undergone language training. However, one critical thing these, are, these authors argue, Thompson and colleagues, is what I have highlighted here, right? Is that uh, prior claims, so you see, the, the prior, they take Primac to say prior claims of a profound disparity between language strain and language naive chimpanzees. So this is what Primac was saying, at least in some of his writings. Um, chimpanzees apparently can be attributed, uh, uh, the naive chimpanzees apparently can be attributed to prior experience with arbitrary tokens consistently associated with abstract relations, not language per se. That is, if you train chimpanzees to focus on these relationships, they can do relational matching to sample. You don't need to train a whole language. Just train on specific tokens and they can do the same thing. So they are saying you need some training. But it's not the type of linguistic training that Primac at all, at least in his earlier writings, had proposed. OK, but you still need some symbolic training. Just recently, um, by the way, and Thompson himself had argued that these, no matter how you train a monkey, the monkey would never be able to solve problems by, anal by analogy. Apes were capable of doing this. Monkeys could not ever do this. He coined the, the term, um, the monkeys are paleological, and the, uh, and the apes are um, analogical. Now, just recently, Joel Fagot and, and, uh, and, uh, and Roger Thompson uh, found evidence suggesting that that was not the case. And they tested baboons. And they found evidence that baboons are capable of relational matching to sample. Now, how did they do it? Because previous studies with apes and monkeys without specific training had failed. Two things are important about these findings. Well, if you want to know how they did it, well, they gave the baboons lots of trials. And they tested lots of baboons. These two things are very important. Let me show you the first one. Don't worry, you do not have to memorize this table. <laughs> I only show you this table to see how many baboons they tested. And also, these are the individuals that solved the task, this one and another one down here. So there are massive individual differences. These baboons were given the same training. Some of them have exactly the same experience. Some baboons did it, others did not. So individual differences are very important. Now, if you are testing only one ape, or two, or three, or four, it is conceivable that what you are detecting is if this ability is not present in every individual, it, you may just not detect it. So first of all, big samples, because individual differences, whether we like it or not, are there. And they can explain some of the results. The second thing is that not only individuals differ, but also the amount of training that they got is massive. So these. When the baboons solving the problems here, so here they reach the criteria of 80% correct, they required 20,000 trials. That is not something that anybody had tried before. So if you give the baboons 20,000 trials to a group, to a large group of baboons, some of them do it. Others do it even later, about 30,000 trials. So it seems that. What you need to do, the difference is not such a qualitative difference, it seems, between the apes and the monkeys, between the language training and non-language training. If you have individual differences and you give them enough training, they will solve the task. And by the way, this is just the training data. The transfer data with new pairs and some cases in which they, they, uh, they, they need to overcome similarity between stimuli, show the baboons have no problem solving even the hardest task that the chimpanzees ever solve. Okay? Now, in addition to that, there are more, there are other studies that show the same pattern. So in relational matching now, not, I mean, you see that for instance, and this is this is important because these are tests that have been used also with humans. It's been shown that at least one out of four capuchin monkeys 
If you, for instance, hide the piece of food in number five, and now you let them choose from here, they will pick number seven. If you see five is the biggest of the set. Now, in order to solve this problem, you need to map the sizes of this set with the sizes of this set. Sometimes number seven will be here, so it's not just a spatial mapping. Now, these monkeys can solve this problem. It's an analogical problem. It's a problem that Dedrick Gentner and colleagues have used with humans. And this is a problem that they can solve um, even after, um, they can solve after a number of trials. And again, individual differences, lots of trials, but it's not impossible for monkeys to solve this problem. If apes are tested, yes, I think they will do the same thing. In fact, we tested apes on a slightly different problem, and it's a spatial mapping problem. And the way it works is this. You have three conditions. The idea is the same. So the experimenter hides food in this set, and the ape can choose from this set. Now, in order, there is a, there is a reward that is hidden here that the ape has not seen as height. In order to decide which of these three cups is baited, it has to use the relative position of these cups. And if it can map the spatial array, his and the experimenters, then it will be able to solve the problem. And you can do different variations. One where the arrays are aligned. Another one where initially they are aligned and then you move them. So now the, the subject has to choose from here. And one where at the time of baiting, they are never aligned. They are just side by side. What you see is that in, this is the easiest combination. As you can see here, you have chimpanzees, bonobos, and orangutans. When you have this set up, yes, all the species can solve that problem. They, if you hide here, they will pick there, no problem. If you hide and then move, yes, that's still no problem. They can still do that. So they don't need the original location where you hide the food. They can just go and get that. However, and this is important because this study also shows us some limitations, is that if you hide the food here, and now they have to search here, that does not work so well. So the mapping is important. So if they can do the mapping before you move the containers, they can do it. But if they have to do the mapping backwards, then they cannot do it. So this study, in my mind, illustrates that they can do some aspects of relational, uh, uh, the, the spatial mappings, but not every possible spatial mapping. OK, we go to the second one. The, 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 uh, I, I devoted more time than anything to the, to the uh, to the analogical reasoning because it's what has been uh, work and it was the first the first indication that the the apes trained with language could be qualitatively different from the non-trained ones. Now, the reverse reward contingency it's it's a it's a very simple task. It's a task in which subjects have to discriminate which one of these two dishes has more food. Individuals do this spontaneously, and they prefer to maximize their food intake. Therefore, they pick the one with more food. And this is something you don't need to train them. You get them to choose between two containers. And if they know that they only can pick one container, they will go for the one that's got more food. But now what you do is after they are doing this, you do a twist. And that's the, the crucial thing. If they pick four, you give them one. But if they pick one, you give them four. OK? So it's you know one trick that comparative psychologists we use. Now, can they solve this problem? You basically have to learn a rule. If you want to get four, you need to pick one. I mean, if we were to play this game with you, now I told you the solution, but I think you would catch up very quickly, and you would be able to do it, right? <laughs> yes. Well, maybe not before lunch. Maybe before lunch is a bad time, but I think you would. Now, when this was given to two chimpanzees, uh, Sally Boyce and um, found that they were awful. They could not solve this problem. However, these chimpanzees were also trained on numerals. And what she did is she replaced the quantities, the food items, for numerals. And then the chimpanzees immediately, they solved the problem. So they knew what they were supposed to do. But when the food was there, they could not solve it. This is some data from one chimpanzee. And you can see here, this is when you use numerals. This chimpanzee does great. And now on session two, you go back to the, to, the, to the food items, terrible. Again, food items on the third session, no way, even worse. Now you go back to numerals, perfect. You see this kind of, this kind of, um, this kind of data uh, led Sally Boyson and colleagues to postulate that the, the, uh, the um, 
the numerical, uh, the, the Arabic numerals, uh, this numerical representation had a deep impact on the way they would solve this problem in, in, the, in their capability for inhibition. Now, it is true that it has an effect, but are the numerals necessary to solve the problem? And I think you can guess what the answer is going to be. The answer is no. Because if you run enough subjects, you're going to find some, like these individuals, that solve the problem. This is just given trials and trials and trials. And eventually, they solve this task. Others do not. And after 400 trials, they're still picking the bigger quantity, even though they are not getting the bigger quantity for 400 trials. So once again, like we saw before, individual differences are important. This that applies to apes also applies to monkeys. So here you have an example with rhesus macaques. And you can see the different lines are different monkeys. And you can see that there are, again, big individual differences. Some monkeys, it takes more than 2,000 trials to solve this task. Others can solve it faster. So again, individual differences is not something that should be uh, forgotten. And as we saw before, Arabic numerals or a symbolic system of representation is not necessary to solve the task. Finally, I get to understanding intentions. And here, uh, Mike Tomasello and I looked at uh, the, uh, the, the data that existed in 96 about the number of different um, cognitive domains or cognitive areas or cognitive skills. So you can see these belong to the physical cognition. These are social cognition. And we compare the results that existed back then and we compare mother rear chimpanzees with enculturated chimpanzees. Enculturated chimpanzees are those that were raised by humans like, like a human child. What we found is there were two aspects, gestural communication and social learning, where enculturated chimpanzees systematically outperform uh, the mother rear chimpanzees. They were better at it. They solved more tasks. They were more sophisticated at, at using gestures and at learning from others. And we postulated that maybe the reason was because enculturation had allowed them to better understand the intentions of others. Now we know we were wrong. And the reason we know we were wrong is because later studies will show, would show that chimpanzees, even when they have not been enculturated, they can understand the intentions of others. And this is one study that uh, Peter mentioned uh, this morning, and it's the one about understanding intentions. Here you have, uh, here Brian is trying to, to put this grape through the hole, but it's not working. As you can see, the chimp is just waiting patiently. It's not going anywhere, and it's, you know, trying, but it's failing. So here, Brian is unable. This is Brian. Brian is unable <laughs> to put the food through. In this other condition, Brian could put the foot through. The hole is big enough, but when the chimp is about to get the grip, he pulls it, and he's teasing the chimp. What we observe is that, and we have, this is just two pairs, but we have a number of others, and this is the results that you show. That in terms of the gestures that you use, that, that the chimpanzees use, what the chimpanzees do is when you are unwilling to give the food, say there is no barrier that would prevent you from giving them the food, they, they gesture more. They, come on, give me, give me, give me. If you are trying and not succeeding, they gesture less. And this is true for two of the trios that we study. A similar result has been found in 12-month-old humans and also in 18-month-olds. So the patterns are very similar. So both species are detecting that even though the result is the same, in no case they got the grape. And, the, and we try to equalize the movements as much as possible between the, the pairs that we compare. But what it shows is that both species are sensitive to the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the motive that the human has, independently of whether they get the food or not. Now, there are other studies on intentions. But I mean, I will not give you, um, you know, more examples. But I want to tell you that since then, there are other studies that have shown not just about intention, but also about the perception of, of others. For instance, this is a study in which uh, uh, a subordinate chimpanzee, you see this subordinate chimpanzee is competing with this dominant chimpanzee. The dominant is trying to monopolize all the food. Well, uh, uh, a number of studies have shown now that the subordinate chimpanzee knows that this piece of food, that is behind a barrier, is not visually accessible 
to the dominant chimpanzees. And when you release them to compete, subordinate chimpanzees preferentially target the food that is hidden. Now, this is important because both pieces of food are visible to the subordinate, but it's preferentially going to look, is going to get this one. Okay? How am I doing on time? How is time? How much longer I have? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Great. Okay, so I'll skip this. It's just, I mean, this, this study was one of the first that, that we did that showed that the chimpanzees were sensitive. Now there are others that are even more sophisticated. And if you want, during the questions, uh, I, can, I can give you another example. But now, for now, let's just say that, you know, after a review that we did in, the, in, the, um, in 2008, Mike Tomasello and I changed our mind. I th we think now that it's not that enculturation allows uh, apes to understand intentions. I think that the even non-enculturated apes do understand intentions and do understand the perceptions of others. So what can we conclude from this? What would be a summary? Analogical reasoning, reverse word contingency, understanding intentions, each of these aspects have been thought that uh, a certain <coughs> type of symbolic system of representation or a, a way of rearing would have an effect? Well, for the first one, I think what we see is an enhancement effect. It's not a major, I think, change because even individuals that are not specifically trained on language can solve it. The same is true for, 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 for the case of reverse reward contingency because even individuals that are not given any special training on Arabic numerals can solve it. And again, like we saw before, individual differences are important. And for enculturation, again, new paradigms have shown that also chimpanzees and other apes that are not enculturated, they show the sensitivities that we thought were restricted to um, enculturated apes. Now, what is the nature of the impact? What can we conclude? Jesse Bering argued that uh, what the, the, uh, the, when we presented the idea that the, um, the apes had an understand, the enculturated apes had an understanding of the intentions of the other, a more sophisticated understanding, he argued, no, this is not, it's not that deep. It's simply that the, that the, uh, that the enculturated apes, the ones that have been raised by humans, see the human as a very meaningful stimuli. And they pay a lot of attention to the human. The human does interesting things, useful things, and that's why they pay more attention to it. So it's not about a deep change. It's about focusing attention to a specific uh, social stimuli in this case. I think he, he, he was probably right. I think that our, our original position, I think, was I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, subscribing it anymore. In addition, it's important to keep in mind individual differences are important in our field. And also that intensive training without any other uh, aspect, any other uh, symbolic training can uh, produce similar results. And finally, I think it's important to realize that some paradigms are more susceptible to, to produce certain results because they tap onto species-specific motivations. Let me give you three examples. This one is one example. The reason I think this works so well is because it's in a competitive paradigm. Now, what I'm going to say is important now. I do not think that you will only find mind reading abilities in competitive settings. I don't think that's the case. I think you can find it also in settings in which two individuals are cooperating. But it's easier to find it in competitive settings. Um, so I don't think it's only restricted to competitive. But I will also say is we still don't have the data. But my prediction is once we start looking at cooperative paradigms, and there already exist a number of them in the literature, I think we will find some of the same things that have been described for competitive paradigms. You, I'm sure you know about the, the, the work of Nikki Clayton and colleagues on the scrap jays caching. These birds do amazing things. And I think it's no coincidence that they have used something that is very natural to these birds to ask them questions. It's caching. You can use the paradigm to ask questions about physical cognition. You can ask this paradigm to, use, to ask questions about social cognition. If you try to find the same abilities of these birds in more instrumental kind of settings, like Skinner boxes, I think you would have a hard time finding that. I mean, it would be much easier to demonstrate 
those uh, abilities in this kind of setting. And finally, I, uh, Juliana Kaminsky was here two years ago, and I'm sure that she, she talked about Rico. And Rico was the, the dog that could, uh, could use um, vocal labels of objects to identify them and go and get them. So he would play this fetching game where you would say, go get the ball, and Rico would go into the next room, rummage between his, his toys, and would bring you the ball. Uh, this, this dog was amazing because he was able to learn something like 200, 300 words. He would use the labels for these words. This is amazing because the previous other attempt that had been tried was with, a, with another dog, in that case a German Shepherd, that learned the amazing number of six words after much training. Rico learned words with extreme ease. And when we asked the owners, how did you train Rico to do this? You know, they answered something that was very telling. And they said, well, actually, it was Rico who trained us. We just, you know, we, we gave toys to the dog, and we named the toys. And then after a while, we realized that he responded to the, to the words that we were using for those toys. This is not just true about Rico, because other dogs, border collies also, have the same thing. Now, I am not saying that Rico is smarter than other dogs. What I'm saying is he's extremely motivated to play this game. And this is a very important thing for him to develop this ability. So the motivation, when he goes hand in hand with certain cognitive substrate, can do wonders. And I think these three examples tell something about that. Now, let me go back to displays reference. And I'm, 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 I'm finishing now. I left this place reference on a, on a park, temporarily park, not because I don't think it's important, but because I wanted to, to talk about the other issues. But I think this place reference tells us something very interesting, and it's that artificial languages provide apes with a vehicle to express their internal states, but it does not create those internal states in the same place. I would say the same things for the previous data that I showed you. It's not that the artificial, the symbolic systems are creating their ability to think about relations, about have better inhibitory control. It's, they are enhancing that, but they are working on something that is already there. And, and again, I mean, you're going to think that uh, Peter and I, uh, maybe last night or, or this morning, we had a joint intention to work together. But I, I, I swear that was not the case. But many of the slides coincide. So in this case, it's a case of we had a common goal, not a joint goal. Okay. So, now, if language, if, la if the artificial language allows us, it, it opens up a window to peek into their psychologies, you can also do the same thing by presenting with, with problems that naturally they don't face. For instance, the, and, and future planning is one such case. The tools that they use in the wild, they, they, they fashion tools, they transport tools, but as Peter said this morning, it's all in the immediate. It's, it's, they plan for immediate goals. You don't see any evidence that they are planning for what they will do tomorrow. But when you present them with a problem where they need to save a tool for tomorrow, or they need to manufacture a tool for tomorrow, they do. And this is work that uh, Matthias Osbath and, and uh, Valerie Dufour and ourselves have done. This is for saving, and also the work of, of Matthias Osbath on the manufacturing of tools. This is, this is the Swedish. The Swedish chimpanzees that like throwing rocks at the visitors that, that was introduced this morning. Now, these are some similarities. I think there is some common ground between humans and, and non-human apes in terms of mind reading, in terms of planning. Of course, we take those abilities one step forward if you want, but there is common ground. And now let me tell you about some important differences. And I'll tell you about one in particular. And this is when we use gestures. There are two modes of these gestures that we observe in children. It's the imperative mode, where the, the, the child points to the adult to get an object. So the goal is get an object. So it points to that because it wants that. And this is a mode that is very, uh, very well developed in chimpanzees and in other apes. So the imperative mode is there. However, one thing that is very striking is when you look at the declarative mode, is that is using an object, showing an object, to just share attention on that, or to indicate, look at that thing that I find interesting. Here, the apes are not interested. They don't do this kind of thing. And you think about it, and you say, well, 
if they are using gestures and in imperative mode, it would seem a simple step to simply use them in a declarative mode. But this is a step that we don't see. As I said before, most of the communication is imperative. It's not declarative. And I think this has, it's one of the first indications that we have that our species has done something special and it's going to have uh, cascading implications for our cognition. This is why I think we are very cooperative species. We are very interested not just about going together with other individuals, but doing things together. We are very interested in the joint aspect of our cognition. Not only we are interested in looking, but also coordinating our efforts. This is uh, Catalonians dancing, the Sardana. This is a traditional dance in Catalonia, and you know, this kind of thing. I mean, you can try to dance this on your own. It's not fun. <laughs> you need to do it with other people. It's crucial. And I tell you this because I try it at home on my own. It just does not work. You need other people there doing the activity together. It's fundamental. A slide that you have seen already, the differences seem to be in the social cognition. Social cognition is the big difference that you see between humans and non-human apes. Obviously, at later ages, you will find also differences in physical cognition, but it seems that the, the differences appear in the physical cognition. In fact, when you, do, you take this data and then you do a factor analysis, you find that humans have this massive factor that groups things that have to deal with social cognition. You don't have such a factor in chimpanzees. This is, this is a paper in which the, the, the authors looked at, uh, and they compared the performance of chimpanzees, uh, capuchin monkeys, and, and, and children. Uh, and they found that the success of the children, but not of the chimpanzees or capuchins, in reaching higher level solutions was strongly associated with a package of socio-cognitive processes, including teaching through verbal instruction, imitation, and prosociality. These data fit really well with what I just told you a minute ago. These things come together in a package. So just to conclude, ape and human cognition, early social cognition is particularly important. It seems to appear in a bundle in humans. It's more dispersed in non-humans, and it's going to be very important to bootstrap later cognition. Now, one important aspect that I focus here is in the social motivation, the declarative, the, 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 this, this drive that our species has to share psychological content with others. But I don't think it's the only thing that, ch that has changed uh, over uh, evolution and since, since we share a common ancestor with chimpanzees and bonobos. I think there are other aspects that also play a role and I think the symbolic function is another important aspect, and the relational power. I mean, some of these things, yes, you can see in the apes, you can see some aspects of it, but our species has simply taken these two other skills to, I think, uh, uh, to, in, a, in a quantitative fashion, we are much better at doing these things than, than our closest living relatives. So finally, can ape language enhance the ape mind? So the answer is yes, it can. But it's important to qualify the answer because it's not about a profound impact. It's not that without the ape language, apes cannot do those things. It's just that uh, it can enhance. They can do it faster. They can do it easier. But it's that it, what it does, um, ape language says it do, it does not seem to create something new, something that without language you will not see in the apes. So, thank you very much. <laughs>